Hi there, everyone. Happy Monday. It's 4 o'clock in New York. The ex-president today getting a lesson the rest of us learned as children that words have consequences. Judge Tanya Chutkin has reinstated her gag order on Donald Trump, meaning that the ex-president is once again barred from making remarks targeting prosecutors witnesses or court staff. New York Times also notes this, quote, in making her decision, the judge also denied a request by Trump's lawyers to freeze the gag order for what could have been a considerably longer period, saying it can remain in effect as a federal appeals court in Washington reviews it. Judge Chuckin's move is the latest chapter, but has become a protracted legal battle between special counsel Jack Smith and Donald Trump with incredibly high stakes. At its heart is this question, will a defendant with one of, if not the biggest megaphone in the world, be subject to any of the same rules as any of the rest of us if we were criminal defendants in the United States? To that question, Judge Chuckin says yes. In her ruling, she writes this, quote, the First Amendment rights of participants in criminal proceedings must yield, when necessary, to the orderly administration of justice. The judge also rejecting the notion that her gag order was too vague to be enforceable, pointing out that Donald Trump himself clearly understood what he was and was not allowed to say. She points to a statement Trump made on the 20th that Chutkin says, quote, asserts that defendant is innocent, that his prosecution is politically motivated, and that the Biden administration is corrupt. It does not violate the order's prohibition of targeting certain individuals. In fact, the order expressly permits such assertions. Four days later, after a stay was placed on the gag order, Trump posted a statement about his former chief of staff and key witness, Mark Meadows, that according to Judge Chutkin, would, quote, almost certainly violate the order under any reasonable definition of targeting. Now, keep in mind when we tell, keep all this in mind, we tell you the next piece of news. This one is being reported by the Washington Post. Quote, Trump appeared to potentially violate Chuckin's order 75 whopping minutes after she gave notice that it was reinstated, attacking his former attorney general, Bill Barr, a potential witness. The ex-president once again under a gag order, restricting his dangerous rhetoric in the criminal case into his attempt to overturn our democracy is where we begin today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Politico national correspondent Betsy Woodruff-Swan is back with us. Plus, former top official at the Department of Justice, Andrew Weissman, is here. Also joining us, the former lead investigator for the January 6th Select Committee, Tim Hafey, is here. Um, let me start with you, Andrew Weissman. Um, the, the paper that has been filed by Jack Smith's office has laid out such a robust and detailed case. But I wonder if it isn't Trump's own conduct that sort of put this over the edge for Judge Chuckin. What do you think? I do. I, I think it is a question of Donald Trump's own continued words and words where he has seen the consequences of those words, that is the reason that you're seeing uh, Judge Chuckin and Judge Ngoran, the judge overseeing the New York civil case, uh, take action uh, because, as they said, they're concerned about the targeting of individuals. In Judge Chutkin's case, she's concerned about jurors, court staff, prosecutors. With Judge Ngoran, the issue was his law clerk. And I think that's why you're seeing those actions. And I think that Judge Chutkin used those words, as you noted, Nicole, uh, to point out why her order was not unduly vague, meaning that it is important for whoever is subject to an order to know what it specifies, because you want to make sure in connection with the First Amendment that you know what's prohibited and what isn't prohibited. And she gave very clear examples um, in her order saying this is what you could do, this is what you couldn't do, and pointed out that in her view that Donald Trump was aware of that um, and knew exactly what her order um, specified. Now it is going to be subject to appeal um, and, a, and he is seeking a stay on appeal of the order. It is in effect right now. But the next thing that we can all expect is um, for Donald Trump to be arguing on appeal why the decision should be stayed while he argues the appeal. Donald Trump is mainlining to his base a First Amendment argument. Um, Tim Hafey, let me let me read you um, 
some of Jack Smith's language um, either designed to counter that or, or, or preempt that. Um, quote, there's never been a criminal case in which a court has granted a defendant an unfettered right to try his case in the media, to malign the presiding judge as a, quote, fraud and a, quote, hack, attack the prosecutor as, quote, deranged and a, quote, thug, and after promising witnesses and others, quote, if you go after me, I'm coming after you, end quote, target specific witnesses with attacks on their character and credibility, even suggesting that one witness's actions warrant the, quote, punishment of death. The defendant nevertheless claims that the First Amendment, combined with his status as a presidential candidate, grants him unfettered rights to do these things and more. The most the court can do, he maintains, is either wait for harassment or violence to occur and then take remedial steps. I mean, January 6th is a moment of, of letting it get that far, right? Waiting for violence to occur and then, um, I don't even know if we call Trump's conduct remedial. I mean, we, the thing about the arguments and the paper that Jack Smith has filed in this case is that it's not abstract. It's not theoretical. We have had a call to violence to, quote, be there will be wild, end quote, and we've had a response. What is the actual objective of Trump's legal argument to create a climate where violence is probable? To create pressure and intimidation, Nicole, much like his words on January 6th created pressure and intimidation on the joint session. We have seen repeatedly how his words are not simply rhetorical, are not hypothetical, are not figures of speech. When he says, be there, will be wild. People take that as an actual invitation. We talked to dozens of people that heard his rhetoric and took it literally. We also heard a lot of people. We worked very hard over the course of the select committee's process, Nicole, to identify real victims, real-time consequences of his rhetoric. When he criticizes Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, they get death threats. When he criticizes Rusty Bowers in Arizona, people drive by his house and threaten to kill him and his family, right? This is not simply words, protected speech, rhetoric, but rather words that have an actual effect. And the president knows that. By now, he is very, very specifically aware of the megaphone that he possesses. So Judge Chutkin is trying to protect the integrity of the judicial process and protect the people who are involved in this case, because again, that rhetoric has real time consequences. Let, let me ask both of you as former prosecutors, have you ever seen any defendant in any walk of life, um, organized crime, um, corporate? I mean, has anyone ever acted like this before? You first, Andrew. No, um, the answer <laughs> to that is no. And um, quite to the contrary, I've been in cases involving special counsel Mueller's investigation where there were limits placed not just on defendants' counsel, which is standard in the District of Columbia, where this case is, but on defendants, uh, Roger Stone being the most notable. And um, to your point, Nicole, and to Tim's point about violence, one of the more chilling aspects of this case was the brief submitted by Donald Trump to the district court uh, saying why there shouldn't be a gag order, saying, if there is violence, that's on the people who take up my words and commit the violence. It's not on me, Donald Trump, saying, I can say whatever I want, and if people act on it, don't look at me. Um, that I find the most chilling, because any responsible person who is trying to avoid violence, who's trying to avoid the fear and intimidation that Tim is has referred to correctly, would be saying, um, I'm trying to do everything to not have that happen, to not be using my words in a way that could lead to that. Any normal person would be trying to make sure that they wouldn't in any way be responsible for harming another person. And this is quite the contrary, where you have uh, the government, I think, correctly saying that these words he knows darn well are going to lead to these consequences. And as Tim said, that is the intent.